All right, so we're joined by my friends, one in Atlanta and one who lives in Atlanta, but is in Galveston, Texas on vacation, Monica McKendrick and Adrian Marshall, systems engineers with Lockheed Martin, one of the most cutting edge technology companies on the planet. Uh, I've got a room full here with me at Velma Jackson High School. We're recording this for all of our computer science engineering students in Madison County Schools and our YouTube channel. And we appreciate you guys, as always, taking some time to talk to us because it's uh, not only is it a super cool um company you're with it's a super cool job and it's something that's always changing and it's something you see the benefits of and we need these young people to look into it that's a really really cool work you guys are doing thank you it's always good to be with you all yeah and uh now before we get into uh, all, all you guys do at Lockheed Martin tell us a little bit about uh, your college background both your HBCU grads uh so love to hear about um your educational background and how that led you to Lockheed Martin Okay, I'll start. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Monica McKendrick. I am from Albany, Georgia, and am a graduate of Clark Atlanta University located in Atlanta, Georgia. I received my bachelor's and master's in computer science from there. And then after college, began working for Lockheed Martin. Um, and I also have an MBA from Rollins College in Winter Park, Florida. Um, I've been with Lockheed about 18 years now and happy to be here. And hello, my name is Adrian Marshall. I apologize if you got the background noise here, uh, but it's uh, joining because I wanted to be a part of this event and uh, had to break away from some other activities here. But yes, uh, I'm a graduate of Southern University in Louisiana, and I studied electrical engineering uh, at Southern University, got my bachelor's degree. And I did transition to get my graduate degree from Georgia in Atlanta, Georgia, where I also studied electrical and computer engineering at Georgia Tech, and I went on to uh, join the Department of Defense down in Warner Robins, Georgia, where I worked one year as a project engineer and on their missile warning systems, and I transitioned to Lockheed Martin shortly after that, where I've been a systems engineer working C-130 simulators and uh, had, having a great time. That's awesome. Now, um, like I said, we, we just watched some videos about Lockheed Martin, some of the most cutting edge technology in the world. Um, now, for those that are may not be familiar, talk a little bit about some of the things Lockheed Martin produces as far as technology and uh, vehicles and weapons and uh, lasers and all kinds of stuff. Yep. So there's a plethora of uh, things that Lockheed Martin is uh, involved with. We uh, pretty much break uh, the company into four major business areas. Uh, we have space, aeronautics, rotary and mission systems, and missiles and fire control. So space, you think about anything, you know, related to space, from missiles to satellites. Uh, you know, we have some involvement with that. Rotary and mission systems is a bit of an enigma to a lot of people just by the name. But when you think rotary, you think, you know, helicopters with the rotary uh, blades on top, mission systems with anything dealing with training. So you have aircraft and land vehicles and sea vehicles. The military men and women and even some commercial <clears throat> uh, people need to be trained on how to use those devices. Yeah. So we uh, get involved heavily with that. Aeronautics, you think about all the aircraft that are not rotary. <clears throat> so fixed wing aircraft, we uh, do a lot of development and leading it. This technology with those aircraft from F 35s to C 130s, uh, C 5s, and other vehicles or air vehicles throughout the world. And missiles and fire control is just in the name. Uh, you, you have missiles that we develop to help protect the country and uh, defend our freedoms. And uh, same with fire control, uh, just protecting our country from uh, missiles that come from other uh, threats throughout the world. Absolutely. Um, now, and I know you, you, you mentioned you guys specialize in the simulators uh, with the helicopters. Um, and first of all, what is a simulator? And, and then where what there's a system engineer, what role do they play in that? Because obviously before something is built, it has to be tested. It has to be, uh, you know, that's where a system engineer comes into play to make sure it's going to work, to make sure the systems are in place to produce it and to operate it. So talk a little bit about how what the simulator does and what your guys' role is. Um, so we built, <clears throat> our team works on training simulators for the C-130 aircraft. 
Um, and we do all types of training and maintenance trainers. Um, so our training simulators, um, I guess our biggest one is called a um, weapon systems trainer that we use to teach um, airmen how to fly a C-130. Um, we also do maintenance trainers um, to maintain the aircraft, um, the, F, the fuselage portion of the aircraft. We have engine trainers, wing trainers, um, different types of simulators and trainers for anything you can think of for the C-130. Um, from a systems engineering perspective on our program, um, we honestly do it all, <laughs> to be quite honest, from proposals all the way to delivery. Um, in between that, you have requirements development and working you know, with the customer on that, mm -hmm. um, design and development of the simulators, um, you know, actually going through the process of building them, um, integration and test of those, um, and of course, sell off and sometimes maintenance after we sell it off, um, you know, just maintaining the simulator for the customer. Uh, we also go in and do different modifications as the aircraft changes in real world. We often go back and um, update the trainers with the different modifications um, to make sure that the um, airmen are being trained efficiently um, to what's available now. Yeah, and that could be based on an upgrade in technology. It could mm -hmm. be based on a change in materials. So if yeah. they change, if so, if Lockheed Martin says, "Look, we still want to build this. We want to build this. We want to build this aircraft, but we're going to change the change the material that we're going to make it with." That starts your job all over again. It does. Yep. So we also we go back, as you mentioned, into the simulators to again make sure it's up to date um, with the new technologies and um, things that are offered in the aircraft. Now, uh, and also, you know, we have a, a lot of kids interested in trades. So you also work very closely with the trade side because the system engineer, but when you have the simulator, you're going to say, look, if you want, if it's going to work, this is how it has to be built. So you also work closely with a lot of trade people as well in, in engineering. We do. I didn't know if Adrian wanted to take that one. Yeah. <laughs> I was trying to come off of you there. <clears throat> so, and, and I want to back up just a step right to uh, your question about what is simulation and why simulation? So you think about our simulators, you're trying to model uh, something in the real world. Yeah. So you have an aircraft that costs tens to hundreds of millions of dollars, and those could be very expensive to train on, especially with someone that hasn't used it before. You don't want to have any type of uh, crashes or accidents in a real aircraft, so you train them in these simulators. So in our simulators, we model real world aircraft and situations so you go into one and, and it's like you're in this virtual 3d video game so, to speak. so it's like you're actually flying an aircraft you're maintaining the aircraft you're doing everything you need to do to operate this aircraft as you would do it in a real aircraft but it's on a simulator <laughs> so uh part of that you know there's a lot of trades that go into building these simulators you think about the base you know, uh, may, uh, base frame of this simulator. Uh, you have welders, you have uh, electricians that are doing the wire in the aircraft. You have people that are coming in for HVAC services because you have to keep the computing equipment cool. So are there's a whole team that? of wow. people from, yeah, from engineers to uh, trades to just different scientists that are putting their knowledge and know-how into these aircraft to make the uh, the most real world experience that we could give uh, the military men and women. Wow. Um, yeah. And, you know, and obviously you guys be engineers, obviously engineering 101 is the engineering design process. And part of the process is actually messing up and found, finding out what the mistake is and fixing it. And I think I can speak for all the other teachers when, you know, every time we, every time we try to build something, we hear, Oh, this is too hard. I quit. How, how often do engineers actually get it right the first time? Not often, not often. There are several iterations um, and tweaking done um, to designs to make sure that it's right. Um, but very rarely is it right on that first go around. Yeah, we have a term within Lucky, one that I don't like as fondly as some others, but it's called fail fast. <laughs> and the idea behind it is like, hey, you go ahead. We know that there's going to be some mishaps and mistakes and failures, but the earlier you catch those in the process, 
you know, the easiest going to be down the line and the learn and the quicker you learn from those mistakes to build a more quality system. So the idea is like, hey, we 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 are going to uh, compensate and plan for those mishaps because we know they happen. And the earlier you catch them, the better it is for the team and for the product that you're putting out. Yeah. And now, before I get to the students' questions, I got because I got a, quite a bit I want to get to, but. <laughs> Um, when it comes to this type of system engineering, how much of it is um, computer based and how much of it is going and actually looking at it and working with your hands? Because I know a lot of engineers say, look, I like the engineering aspect, but I like being be able to take stuff apart and put it back together. Others say I like looking at code all day. So how much of a mix is that? Because engineering does incorporate both skills. You know, huge projects like this, we really have a, a full gamut of, you know, those that want to be strictly technical, they love coding all day, and that's what they do. You have some people that don't, you know, they want to be more hands-on. You have a lot of testing and design and implementation, uh, you know, first uh, test sets that you have to, you know, actually go in and put, um, you know, elbow and hard labor uh, work into those uh, devices. Uh, the thing I like about, you know, our job, you know, that Monica and I kind of share is that we, we have the luxury of doing both, right? There is a lot of, you know, desk work where you have to be reviewing design, designs or you have to be in meetings or just doing desk work. But at the same time, we get to break away from that and we go out in the field, you know, different locations in this uh in the domestic uh, United States or you know outside the country, get to travel and put your hands on these devices, get to uh, play with these uh, devices like a uh, big video game, and it makes it exciting. So I think the great thing about engineering is like you can kind of craft and shape that to be what you want it to be. If you're someone that just likes to design things, design circuits, and chase parts, hey, there's an opportunity for you. If you like to code all day. Hey, we love to have people like that. But if you want that flexibility, you know, engineering will allow you that flexibility to be both hands-on and uh, strictly, you know, technical. Absolutely. Now, Monica, did you want to add to that? Um, no, I didn't. I think Adrian hit it on the on the nail. Um. Like I smiled when he said our job is a combination of the two, because that's honestly what I like about it. Um, being able to do, you know, the desk work and the meetings, but it's also a reward at the end, oftentimes to be able to get to travel and see the world um, at the same time, being hands on with the products that we're making. Yeah, that's got to be cool to see a finished product and say, man, I had a, a big part in that, especially in something, first of all, so freaking cool. And then just so important to our uh, to our nation's military. Um, but I do got uh, some questions from the students. I'll get to as many of these as I can. Um, and this first one is really good. This is Justin Clerk. He's a senior. He's actually interested in video game design. But um, this is a good question along the same lines. He asked, how important is it for you for what you uh, when you put new technology in a simulator to be easy to use for the end user? I think it's very important because the easier it is for them to understand, the more likely it is for them to actually use it. And anything that we put on the simulators, we want them to be able to use. Um, so making sure that they understand it, can use it, um, the requirements of it, um, I think is very important in our in our day to day job. Let me just say, uh, I really enjoy your student courses. Like every time we do one of these events, these are like the best courses. And I I just envision you having this like really brilliant classroom. They come with all these great courses. So thank you for the courses and kudos to your class. But uh, just to add a little bit to what Monica said there, uh, absolutely. You know, we kind of look at it from two aspects, right? Uh, one, you want it to be easy to use uh, for everything Monica just mentioned there. But two, you also want it to be realistic. Yeah. And the fact that it's realistic might mean that it's not necessarily easy to use, right? Um uh, so you do want to make sure you're you're providing positive training as opposed to negative training. Negative training is anything that you know uh, that is not correct in the training. There might be some bad habits, things of that sort. So you don't want to make it too easy for them. It's 
stuff that is not realistic, but at the same time, you want to balance that and make sure, like, hey, this is real world training. This is exactly how the aircraft works, but everything behind it, we're making it easy for you to use and operate our system. Awesome. Uh, this is Amari Williams. He's in ninth grade. And he asked, what was your main motivation to get into engineering? Um, I think for me, so I majored in computer science, like I mentioned, bachelor's and master's coming into Lockheed with it. And I honestly thought I wanted to be a software engineer. I came in, <clears throat> that's actually what I started with. Um, I entered, Lockheed has an engineering leadership development program. And so I was able to do different rotations and kind of find my niche. Um, so I started out in software and I enjoyed software. Um, as Adrian mentioned, it's one of those jobs where I can sit and code all day. Um, but then I got a taste of doing systems engineering work and it was just different. And I got to see engineering differently and a little bit more hands-on and I was learning a lot. And so I kind of just stayed in that field. Um, so that's how I kind of ended up in engineering software and then systems. Yeah, for me, uh, I was probably about the age of many years through this now because I was in high school when I decided this is what I wanted to do. And before I decided that, I had no idea what engineering was or what engineers did. And I had a, a great uh, teacher. I had an industrial arts class. I'm not sure if they even offered it these days. Uh, but an uh, industrial arts teacher, <clears throat> uh, he had an assignment for the class where, where we would investigate some things that we might want to pursue as careers. And I had no idea. And I was talking to him about it. And he asked me what were some things I was good at. And I told him, hey, I like math, pretty decent in science. He was like, you might want to consider engineering. And at that point, uh, with that class project, I looked up different uh, you know, types of engineers, chemical, electrical, and mechanical. And it's like, all right, I think I can do this. And it looks like they have a pretty nice pay as well. So <laughs> let's, let's see what that's all about. And did a few engineering summer camps at Southern University. And I figured like that was a good fit for me. And uh sticking with it since. That's awesome. Uh, and and both and both you made a good point because um, when when these kids are in college, we always encourage them. Yeah, the academic side is extremely important, but get that internship, get that experience, not only to build your network, but to you know get a taste of what it's like. Because you may do an internship and say, "Hey, this sucks. I need to do a different kind of engineering." So I think that's twofold on the importance of um, of the of the internships and then these summer programs. I know Jackson State here in Jackson has an unbelievable summer STEM program um, that you know anybody interested in engineering they would love to have uh, love to have some of our local students join it. So that is a great point that both of you did that and and that was before those were really being pushed. So uh, great point on that. Uh, this is Layla Young. She's our Miss Bellman Jackson. Was just accepted into Spelman College uh, on Saturday. Congratulations. So, uh, yeah, she's uh, really Let's looking. Let's go. Yeah, really looking for the HBCU route. So, um, <laughs> yes, what is the most challenging thing you have ever faced while working on the simulators? The most challenging. Yeah, so, go ahead, Adrian. All right. Yeah, I'll say for me, uh, <clears throat> it's really for me the dynamic nature of the simulators. Like you go in each day. You have a plan, and you think you're going to execute a plan, and just things go left really quickly. And there are some times where there's a huge challenge that, that could come up and you don't have an immediate solution. And I, I don't want to say most challenging because it happens all the time. I feel like it's the same challenge now, but it's just a different challenge to solve. Uh, so you might come in and say, hey, you know, the customer uh, needs this device in two weeks something major fails on the device, right? Wow. So you're at a point where you have to figure out a recovery plan. And say, all right, here's what went wrong. Here's the why it went wrong. And here's what we can do to recover. And that recovery piece can be difficult sometimes. You might need a component that you can't get for another week or two. Or you might need a person that is not available for another week or two. Wow. So the, the biggest part of that to me is just managing the expectations of the customer and trying to resolve these challenges within the time frame and within the budget that you have. I think he explained it so accurately. Like every day you can come in and have a plan and things can go left and left isn't always a bad thing, um, but it's our job to resolve it, right? 
and as he said, manage the expectations and, and get the job done, whatever, you know, problems we run into. Um, so I can't think of one thing that's been the most challenging. I just think every day is different um, and presents a new challenge. Yeah. Um, and that's the cool thing about it. It's <clears throat> never the same thing every day. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if, if somebody wants to work in a field that's not monotonous and you really get to face something new every day, engineering needs you. Um, and and yeah. even more even more so now than it was when you guys were coming. Just the way industry is going, the way manufacturing is going, engineers are needed in every field. Now, now this, is a, this is a good question. This is Catherine Johnson. She's a junior. And she asks, do you guys ever feel discriminated against as black engineers in a, uh, in a white male dominated field? Yes, is my answer. Um, not only is it a white male dominated field, there's not many women in the field. Um, so I've, I've definitely run into, um, instances and situations where I don't feel my, um, thoughts and opinions were valued, um, and were looked over. Um, but it was important that I, you know, stick to my guns, continue to present the data. I made sure I have factual information to present and bring to the table, um, and make sure that I'm being heard. Yeah, so <clears throat> definitely agree. I don't want to say all the time, right, but definitely enough that it, it makes you think about it and you know, feel comfortable sometimes. And, you know, similar to Monica, you know, there are some times where it's kind of based on the color or the school you went to, you know, your opinion or your input might not feel as valued as some other people. And, you know, there, uh, there have been times where We've made a case for something and it wasn't taken uh, directly and immediately and they got a second opinion. And the second opinion was the exact same advice that we gave them the first time. So, and, you know, it just came from somebody that looked different than them, right? But, so you have to uh, definitely learn how to manage those uh, situations. Sometimes it's a heart-to-heart -heart, uh, discussion with you and folks, the one that respect, respectively respectfully, of course, and uh, sometimes it's just, uh, just putting in the work that you need to put in to prove that, you know, your input is just as valuable as uh, anyone else. Yeah, and you also made a good point about um, even within the Black community, you have some people that would discredit HBCU. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, 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 fortunately, that's becoming uh, less common, but it still happens. Um, and, um, you know, especially Monica, in your case, having uh, two degrees from HBCUs, but even um, Adrian having one from HBCU, one from a PWI, that is a great mix. And I think a lot of people love to see that, but that can still cause doubt and it's completely unfair. And even, uh, and that's, you know, as much uh, notoriety as these HBCU engineering programs are getting, you shouldn't let anybody, uh, anybody just credit that at all because, you know, you guys came from two of the most prestigious universities in the country, HBC or not. Uh, and there's no doubting that. Um, I've got two more. I've got two more from the questions or two more from the students <laughs> all day. Um, uh, this is Nakasha James, one of our basketball players here. She's a senior. And she asked, uh, when you first started getting into the simulators, how long did the process take? So uh, I'll start and say the process is still going, and I've been doing it for 15 years, right? <laughs> 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 but getting into it, it, like it was, it was, uh, I won't say an easy transition, but uh, coming into a, a big company like Lockheed Martin, my background is electrical engineering, and my first opportunity with uh, Lockheed was in systems engineering. So I didn't necessarily have to do anything to be put in this position from a systems engineering perspective. Uh, but I did have to take a lot of classes and uh, do a lot of on-the-job training to learn about simulators, to learn about the aircraft. And I say it's, it's an ongoing process because there's still things that I don't know about the aircraft, still things I don't know about the simulator. But, you know, each day, you know, you kind of learn more and you get more proficient in other things. You take it one chunk at a time. Right? So these teams are divided amongst, the, amongst dozens of different people and all have their specialties. So the expectation is that you are not an expert on every single part of the aircraft or the simulator, but you know enough about engineering, you know enough about problem solving, you know enough about the systems engineering process 
do uh, help the team navigate those challenges and uh, you know, deliver a, product, a quality product. Yeah, I kind of agree. Um, like Adrian said, um, definitely still learning. Um, and as I mentioned, I've been with Lockheed and on this team for a very long time. Um, I think we all know a little about a lot. No, a lot about a little. Yep. <laughs> I think I was like, I think I said a, that. A little about a lot. A little about a lot. And so, yep. um, and that's okay. We aren't, like as Adrian mentioned, we aren't expected to be experts in, in every single thing. Um, but with our um, engineering mind, being able to think through problems and solve things and know who to go to for assistance when needed um, definitely comes in handy. All right, I've got one more from the students, uh, and this is and this is Brenda Escudero. Um, she's also a senior, and she asks, "What is the uh, what is the best project you've worked on, or have you always worked on simulators?" Um, for me, I think that my current project is the best. I've been on this team working with the C one thirty training simulators, um, thirteen of my eighteen years with Lockheed, wow. and um, I want to say I have thoroughly enjoyed it. I've had the opportunity to work with different um, commands within the military, um, just different customer sets. I've had the opportunity to travel all over the world. I've been to Italy, Japan, Germany wow. um, with this program. Um, and just working with the different customer sets and being able to deliver a product that um, the military men and women use to you know, learn different missions, um, to complete their jobs, to keep us safe and them safe. Um, I, at the end of the day, I really do enjoy that in seeing them use the products that we make. Um, so this has been my favorite so far. Okay. So uh, it's, it's tough for me because everything Monica mentioned about this job is exactly why I love it, right? It's, it's great to be working on a product that you can see firsthand. Absolutely. Benefiting not only the military, and, but also benefiting the country, right? But uh, I was working on a project prior to this one where it was on a missile warning receiver. So the you know, objective of this missile warning receiver is to detect when a missile is coming your way and, you know, help you react to it. So we would have to take these. Uh, missile warning receivers out to near Area 51, where you know they say all the aliens are kept in secret. So it was good to go out to that area and you just kind of fire, you know, uh, dummy rounds at these missile warning receivers just out in the middle of nowhere and see how your product reacts to it. That was a, a pretty good experience for me, uh, just kind of seeing it firsthand and seeing, you know, live fire shot at. You no, know, near not at, but uh, towards uh, these missile warning receivers. Uh, so that was a good uh, experience, and you know, I think traveling with all that makes it even even better. That's awesome. Now we're almost out of time, uh, and as always, we thank you guys so much for taking time for us. Just so cool what you guys do. Um, but before we go, you know, let these young people know why engineering needs them. You know, you guys both grew up in the South as black kids, just like we have here. Um, but yet you guys are, you know, on the cutting edge of some of the coolest engineering jobs that are so important to our country. Um, but like we just said earlier, engineering needs people. It needs people that can solve problems. It needs people with technological skills and it needs a diverse group. So why should these young people think about getting into engineering just like y'all? Yeah, I can uh, start there. So uh, just about with anything, especially in technology, you want, you know, your your team and your country and those that you're working with to be on the leading edge of technology. Because uh, you think about the military, and anytime there is one country that has a technology advantage over another country, they the, the country at the disadvantage should be concerned, right? So we want to make sure we always have that uh, technological advantage uh, in anything we do, and that's uh, that. That uh, spans a wide variety of different skill sets and needs across the board. So the most advanced that you can make your product, that means you or your country, they're going to have the advantage. And that speaks a lot for freedom. That speaks a lot for safety. That speaks a lot for just advancing technology. So there's so many cool things out, you know, that uh, 
as burnt out when I was a young kid. Like, I never dreamed that I would be looking at somebody in Jackson, and I'm three states over or two states over right now, and talking to them real time. That's, yeah. you know, that's, it just blows my mind. And uh, so I'm excited to see what this next generation is going to bring in, in terms of technology and, and advancements to the current technologies we already have. Absolutely. Yes, I mean, totally agree with Adrian. And I think anything, if you can think of it, I think somewhere in that life cycle of that product or service being made, engineering was a part of it. And so I wouldn't just encourage people, like no matter what you have an interest in, if, if it's STEM related, you can find your fit from an engineering perspective. Um, it doesn't necessarily have to be the defense industry like Adrian and I, it can be um, with social media, Facebook, or, you know, different types of technologies or, or, or um, tools or things that you have an interest in, um, you know, science and technology fits into it. Um, so you can make your way in the field, um, no matter what the field is. Absolutely. Um, and, and there's a need for diversity and there's a need for a lot of need for strong minds and, and good and good tech minds. But again, thank you guys so much for fitness in your schedule. Monica McKendrick, uh, award-winning uh, engineer there in Atlanta. Adrian Marshall on vacation in Galveston, Texas. We thank you guys so much for taking some time to talk about Lockheed Martin with us today. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Talk to you soon. See you. All right.